I guess like maybe I can start with sort of talking a little bit about some of the things that are that are in the news today. Um, and then um, I'll respond to kind of any any questions that that people have um, as best as I can. Um, obviously, things have changed a lot since the last time we were doing these. Um, you know, a lot of people are are describing this as being a, a totally new pandemic at this point because of the um, the the variants of concern and the way that um, that COVID is has been spreading over the last few weeks. Um, I guess from a from a numbers perspective, I think a lot of the epidemiologists are cautiously optimistic that maybe we've hit the peak of the the number of new cases. Um, that those numbers across Canada in terms of numbers of new cases daily seem to be dropping um, a little bit. Uh, in Ontario, those numbers peaked um, kind of last week in the mid 4000s. Um, and they seem to be sort of trending downwards into the into the 3000 new cases per day. Um, but that optimism is, I guess, tempered a little bit because we know that a percentage of, of, of those cases every day are, are going to continue to require hospital care kind of into the future, um, including potentially ICU admission and, and ventilation. And so although those total numbers are, are dropping, there's still, you know, it's still a long road ahead in terms of, of moving, um, moving forward. Um, the numbers I think are, are you know, they're, they're interesting and they're, they're a stark reminder. Um, right now, there's about 800 people in um, intensive care units across um, the province. Uh, 605 of those are on ventilators, and that's about double um, the total number that there was during the worst of the second wave in January. Um, so although there's reason to be optimistic, it, it's a long road ahead, especially for uh, my hospital based colleagues um, who are who are doing this work kind of every day. Um, so I thought I might talk a little bit about, um, you know, is there, I guess, you know, thumbs up, is there an interest in, in having me sort of talk a little bit about uh, the um, uh, AstraZeneca vaccine and the blood clot risk and kind of what what that is all about. I don't know if people are are interested in in hearing a little bit more about that. Yes. No. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> all right. Um, so the reports of these rare blood clots started coming out. Um, from uh, from Europe um, as the AstraZeneca vaccine was rolled out. Um, and in Europe of about sort of there were about in April about 34 million um, AstraZeneca vaccine doses had been administered and they'd had about 80 of these uh, rare blood clots that formed um, especially in the uh, in around people's brains. And so they wondered if there was potentially a connection to the the AstraZeneca vaccine. Um, and you know the same thing is is sort of wondered in, in Canada as well. We've administered about 1.1 million of the uh, doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine. Um, and there have been uh, I think six or eight cases of these rare blood clots um, happening. So initially um, a lot of the thought was that maybe this was something that was happening, you know, mo mostly to young women, that it was something about being young and being female um, that caused these blood clots to, to form. Um, and there is some science behind that because uh, people that have higher estrogen levels, like young females, um, do tend to be at higher risk of developing blood clots. Um, but kind of as the science has evolved, that seems to not so much be the case. Um, these uh, initially these doses were administered to frontline healthcare workers like nurses and personal support workers who are disproportionately women and so a lot of these cases were reported in women because they were the ones that were getting the vaccine not so much that it was something about being young and female that puts you at higher risk of of having these blood clots mm -hmm. Um, which is why the guidelines have changed over the last little bit in terms of age. Um, what seems to be happening is in a very, very small percentage of people who receive this vaccine, they have an immune response that targets their platelets. So your platelets are the sticky cells um, in your blood that prevent you uh, from bleeding out if you have a cut. So if you have ever had a scab on your arm, those are your platelets hard at work making sure that that bleeding stops. And platelets are very important. We need to, we need to have platelets to stop us from bleedings, bleeding. 
but if our platelets are too sticky or if we have too many of them uh, then they can cause blood clots to form in in problematic places so what seems to happen with this is is our immune system causes our platelets to be both too few in number and too sticky so this is a, a condition that simultaneously increases the risk of bleeding and of clotting but it's an immune response that seems to be triggered by this vaccine in a very, very, very small percentage of people. Now, these blood clots um, seem to form only in a couple of places. One is in something called your cerebral venous sinuses, which is the blood supply that drains the blood out of the brain. Um, and the other place seems to be around the spleen. Um, so the people that are getting these blood clots um, tend to have um, within sort of four to 14 days of getting the vaccine really really severe headaches and sometimes other neurological symptoms like vomiting um, nausea um, seizures um, changes to vision severe backache abdominal pain those kinds of things um, the majority of the time these blood clots are treatable as well uh, they can be treated um, unfortunately uh, you know there there was a death uh, of a woman in Quebec um, from from these blood clots um, so the science is still really new it's really hard to predict who ex who is going to be the person that that has this complication arise um, but the risk of having these blood clots form seems to be somewhere between one in a hundred thousand and one in two hundred and fifty thousand doses administered. Now, for the person that that happens to, it's a tragedy and it's awful. Um, but these are often the risks that we're dealing with with most with a lot of the medical interventions that we use, including doing things like prescribing antibiotics, doing surgery, um, all of these interventions where you're having to weigh the potential benefit against against a risk. And so, um, you know, there, there are definitely people who shouldn't be getting this, uh, this vaccine. So people that already have underlying disorders that make their platelets sticky um, or that cause them to have um, that increased risk of clotting probably shouldn't be getting this vaccine. Um, but for the average person, the risk remains extremely, extremely low. Um, so that's, that seems to be what's kind of happening with that, um, with that, uh, the, the blood clotting issue with the AstraZeneca vaccine. Oh, and, and that also seems to apply to the Johnson and Johnson vaccine as well. Um, oh, really? Yeah. Hmm. So it's, uh, again, extremely rare, um, but, but definitely the case. Um, so I guess what sometimes happens is, you know, there's the science, there's the evidence that that comes out of the initial trials uh, for these vaccines. Um, but then there's also the, you know, the real world data, right? And so um, sometimes what, can, what needs to happen is regulatory bodies like the FDA or Health Canada need to put a pause on, um, on vaccines and, and treatments if they see something new in the real world data that wasn't present in the trial data. That doesn't necessarily mean that the intervention isn't safe or that won't be found to, to be safe eventually. It just means that they need to take a second and reflect on, on the science and the evidence and you know, make another judgment call about what needs to, uh, what, what recommendations should be made, what needs to change. Um, which is, I guess, challenging because you know, we're seeing different recommendations all the time um, about vaccines and who should be getting them and what age and all of those kinds of things. And it can be really confusing. Um, but what we all have right now is a front row seat to how science happens. Um, there's always new evidence that's coming up. There's always things that, you know, treatment strategies or ideas that, that need to change and evolve as time goes on. Um, but what I'm telling my patients is the risk of getting the blood clots um, as we understand it right now, being between like one in 100,000 and 250,000 is about the same risk as dying from being struck by a lightning strike. So it's a very, very, very low risk um, proposition. And the benefits are, are, are very clear. There's definitely much greater risk of having complications from COVID than there is of having complications from the vaccine itself. Mm -hmm. So that's, the, that's kind of the blood clotting issue. Um, 
it's exciting that today, I think about 160,000 doses of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine are arriving in Ontario. Um, and my understanding is that those are going to be deployed into, um, you know, high risk, um, high, highly vulnerable populations um, over the next over the next little while, right? So the hope is that that will go to places like homeless shelters, migrant farm workers, um, you know, precariously housed individuals, um, you know, poor racialized communities, where the follow up to get a second dose into somebody's arm is really challenging. And those people have a much higher risk of complications from, from COVID-19 because they're, they're poor, they're living in congregate um, settings, their health, their underlying health conditions are, are often poorly managed. Um, and so that's, uh, that's a really positive thing as well. Yeah, that's good. Mm -hmm. Very good. The Johnson & Johnson is just one shot, right? Just one shot, one and done, that's what, uh, one that's and what one and done for the Johnson and Johnson vaccine. Um, and in the US, um, they haven't approved the AstraZeneca vaccine. Um, and so the Johnson and Johnson vaccine is is being used widely um, throughout the US the way that um, that the AstraZeneca one is being used in Canada. Um, so it's certainly as the supply increases that may be it may be deployed more more broadly, but it's being um, my understanding is it's going to be deployed in a much more focal way over the next little bit. Well, that's good news. Yeah. Now, the coroner is now talking about sudden deaths at uh, outside of hospitals, and they're not sure why. But I guess it's probably rapid onset of COVID, I guess. Yeah, I don't know what to say about that. Um, I know that yeah. there's there's more people that are, certainly the, the coroner's reports indicate that there are more people dying at, at home of COVID as well, um, rather than dying in the hospital um, during this wave as well. Um, yeah. I think that's just, again, the number of, of people that are, that are sick um, and also, um, yeah, that people seem, there are some people that get very sick very quickly. Um, yeah. yeah. No. Can I ask you a question about our local hospital or Oakville Auger Hospital? Um, how many patients from uh, Toronto are being shipped out to Oakville? Because I gather there's quite a few. Yeah, um, I don't have the number from today. Um, I know a few days ago, um, let's say probably a week ago, they they actually received like six new patients in the course of a day um, that that needed a sort of intensive care um, from from the the other hospitals. Um, yeah, I was. I'll try to get that up. That was. Uh, I don't need to know exactly how many. Yeah, I just but, yeah. It is. It is definitely something that is that's happening. Um, I'm glad we have the room. That's good. Yeah. Well, except we don't because, um, there, and the reason I asked was I have a specialist appointment for sometime in maybe August, depending on how many patients get sent to us yeah. uh, at the hospital for a treatment that takes probably five seconds. Mm -hmm. I have to be there an hour and a half ahead of time and he's only doing them in the hospital setting. Like why? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, it, I, yeah, I don't have a, a specific answer to that. I mean, there are, there are some days where OT doesn't receive any patients from outside. And then there are some days where they receive, you know, two, four, kind of six patients. Um, and uh, you know, again, it's it is because there is uh, some capacity in our hospital, whereas there just isn't capacity in some of the the, the hospitals in in downtown. Um, you know, the decisions in terms of of proceeding with surgeries and procedures and those kinds of things are kind of being made on a on a case by case basis. Um, and certainly. You know the the goal with the hospital is not to sort of sacrifice um, you know critical procedures like cancer surgeries and emergency surgeries and and those kinds of things, but you know needing to prioritize which are the essential surgeries and and procedures to be done right now and which are the ones that that can be deferred um, again until um, until the 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 number of of beds in the hospital opens up again, right? The backup from a, from a scheduled surgeries as opposed to urgent uh, emergency surgeries has gone from a quarter million to a, 
a third of a million in really in the last month and a half. It's that to, to, to catch up after this is over is going to be one big task. Wow. Oh, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. No, it'll take, it'll take years. Um, to, yeah. Yeah. Get yeah. On top of that. Yeah. Yeah. Cause new surgeries, new, new need keeps flowing into the system, even as that, mm. that backup happens. So no, that will be, um, that will be the, one of the big challenges sort of after, after things settle down for sure. Are you saying we're getting older and not younger? Darn. <laughs> Oh. That, whole, that whole yeah that whole that whole you know baby boom um you know yeah generational yeah yeah <laughs> i think we're all getting a little bit older to be honest yeah. Me too. quite a bit yeah um i guess i was i was sort of thinking a little bit about about sort of you know also you know, as people as questions come up sort of in my office some of the things that people are asking me um and one of the things that people often ask is that, you know, what what does it really mean when you hear that a that a particular vaccine has a certain percentage of e efficacy? Um, and what does what does that mean for me as an individual? Because certainly one of the things that that I have been seeing is people who want to kind of uh, vaccine shop or wait for vaccines um, because they because there's there's greater efficacy um, of those vaccines. Um, so I guess you know. Efficacy is a measure of um, the risk of getting COVID uh, if you get a particular vaccine. So when they do the trials, so thinking about like the Pfizer trial, there were 43,000 people in that trial. They separated them into two groups. They gave half of the people the vaccine and they gave half of the people a shot of salt water. And then they sent them off into their lives to kind of see what happened. Um, and in the Pfizer vaccine spe trial specifically, I think there was like 172 people in the placebo arm, or I guess 162 in the placebo arm that got COVID and only eight people in the vaccine arm that got COVID. Oh, wow. So that that's very impressive efficacy, right? Um, wow. So you can sort of take that math and apply it to the other vaccines as well. So let's say in the AstraZeneca vaccine, you would have said, okay, well, in that one, like 63 people in the, um, in the, the placebo arm got the, got, got COVID and, and only, you know, 20%, 20 people in the, uh, the other arm got COVID uh, or in the intervention arm got COVID. Um, but that's measuring like the absolute number of cases of COVID in each of those in each of those arms. What each of the vaccines was able to do, every single one of them, just as well as any other one, was to prevent severe COVID vaccine, COVID infection and hospitalization. Mm -hmm. So there's actually no difference between Pfizer, J&J, &J, Moderna, and AstraZeneca when it comes to preventing severe infection and hospitalization. And so when we think about what the overarching population goal is, it's to keep people out of hospital and it's to keep people from getting severely ill. It's not necessarily to reach COVID zero. And so with, with the goal being to keep people out of hospital, really every shot in every arm has a role to play. Um, and so whether the vaccine is 95% effective or 70% effective, um, if someone is offered the vaccine, I'm a vaccine, if they're eligible for any one of the vaccines and they don't have a contraindication to it, I'm recommending that they get it. Um, these variants are very, very contagious. And so until we reach herd immunity, which is where like 90 or 95% of the population is not going to get COVID, um, there's kind of two ways out for people. Either you'll get sick or you'll get a vaccine, right? And so the more people that can get um, shots in their arms, the better. Um, I think it's really important that people talk to their healthcare provider if they have any questions about whether, about if they do have any contraindications um, to any one of the, the vaccines. Um, and to, to better understand so that people are going into to that process um, informed and aware of what the potential complications of the vaccine are but um yeah when it's when it's available yeah people should absolutely get it and the who's eligible for vaccine changes every couple of days uh mm -hmm. in halton 
uh, they expand um, who's eligible for, for getting a vaccine like every few days. So as of Monday, anybody who's pregnant in Halton as well as a caregiver is eligible to get a vaccine, anybody. Right. So if if you are pregnant, then you just get on the Halton website and you can uh, register to get a vaccine. Um, anybody that's an essential worker. So if you can't do your job from home and you're in an essential industry, you work at Ford, you work in uh, food services, you work in a, a factory that does distribution of food or medical supplies or whatever it is, you are eligible to get a vaccine. Right. Um, if you're over the age of 40, you're eligible to get an AstraZeneca vaccine. And so um, there, it's, it's, it's actually growing pretty rapidly who can, who can get these vaccines. And so I try to stay ear to the ground in terms of um, who's eligible and I'm trying to reach out to my patients that I know sort of fall into those categories. So I encourage anybody uh, who can to do the same. Mm -hmm. Oh. One, one thing uh, I had a thought, but it's probably right off the wall. Um, I know they're not they're not um, vaccinating children just yet. Mm -hmm. um, I'm hoping maybe by the summer when the, so that they can all go back to school. Yeah. But Johnson and Johnson, because it's a one shot, you're done. Be good for children because then they don't have that worry about that second dose because I think it's going to be traumatic enough just giving them one. <laughs> Um, yeah, it, I, I don't know. Um, yeah. Right now, the Pfizer one is the one that's been approved down to age 16. Um, okay. And right now they're doing trials on the Pfizer vaccine for 12 to 15 year olds. And so once that data is in, the hope is that they'll be able to, to sort of move that eligibility down to 12 to 15 year olds. And then the hope is after that, they'll be able to, to sort of continue to move that that age downward, as long as there are no sort of complications that are arising from, from those trials. Um, I don't know what trials are ongoing for AstraZeneca and J&J, &J, to, um, to be honest right now, but I know that the goal is to try to establish the safety of these vaccines in children so that they can be deployed to them as well. So you too, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's important, yeah. It's, yeah, it is for sure. Yeah. And, and again, I think, you know, the, 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 the case of, um, you know, the 13 year old girl in Brampton who died highlights that point, right? I mean, it's, it, it's, it's tragic. It's, a, you know, it's a one in a million thing that, that, that happened um, to her and, but, but it, it can happen, right? You know, and we do see that with influenza as well, like otherwise healthy people in their 20s, 30s, teens that can die. Um, of of these of these viral infections yeah i think that there was a an even younger child and a baby in british columbia that okay. died of covid related complications as well so it can it can happen so yeah it is important to as the data arises to include uh kids uh in the population of people who are being vaccinated for sure many of us are very lucky and have already had one and mm -hmm. uh, i don't really care what i got and i don't really care if there's what the second one's going to be i don't I just don't want to get it until everybody else has had their first one but um is there issues coming up with uh mixing the 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 brand names for the second dose which may be months and months away i don't really care mm -hmm. i mean we're able to isolate ourselves so you know we're not immune to it the disease but we can certainly protect ourselves better than many people can so yeah um i don't know that there's i don't know that there's issues i know because the science and the evidence is based on people getting doses of the same vaccine that's going mm -hmm. to be the goal right because the, yeah. because that's the sort of known quantity um we don't really know what the impact of of mixing and matching is going to be but you know i certainly could foresee a, a circumstance where they may need to do that out of necessity. So um, we'll have to see over the next little bit what the data is in other places. Again, there are other countries in the world that are ahead of where um, you know Canada and the US are in terms of vaccination. And there may be some experience to be drawn from that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And there may be yeah. a future where you, you may have gotten the 
Pfizer vaccine, um, you know, this round, but, you know, if there's a booster that's needed in 2022 or 2023 or whatever it is, you may need to get a different brand, right? And we certainly do that in medicine with other vaccines as well, right? There are, there are a number of different companies, for example, that make the chickenpox vaccine right? So Merck mm -hmm. makes one and GSK makes one. Um, and, uh, and we generally, you know, would not see a problem giving a child like a Merck vaccine when they were sort of 18 months old, and then giving them a different one when they were like five, right? So, yep. so there, there may be a future where having had the Pfizer vaccine now that doesn't necessarily commit you to that one for the rest of your life. But, um, but okay. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. There's only one long-term care facility in Halton that's under outbreak right now. Um, and there's two cases and they don't seem to be residents. <laughs> so oh, really? um, I, that is something that also I think is one of the very, very bright kind of shining stars in, in this, this part of the pandemic, like as much as as much as what's happening in hospitals is um, is is awful, um, the vaccines and you know the the public and the the whatever other measures they're taking seem to be keeping this out of the long term care facilities at least away from the residents at this point, and oh, that okay. that is something yeah. to be really excited about. Yeah. That's good. Yes. That's good. Wow. Mm -hmm. Well, you're just a breath of fresh air. Good to see I'm you. Trying to be, I'm trying. I, I'm trying to. You know, it is. It is very. Um, the the challenge and the tragedy is very real right now. It is for for colleagues in hospitals across the province. They are overwhelmed. They are exhausted. They are in dire circumstances, um, and so the news is very much focused on that and it should be because I think we need to understand what's happening right now and we need to understand what lessons can be drawn from that and and what we need to do moving forward to make sure that you know essentially this never happens again um, but in the midst of that I think it's really important to also have some some hope and to have some light on the on the horizon because because uh, these are dark days for a lot of people yeah. Yeah, we're all getting tired. <laughs> very tired. Yeah, very, very, very tired. Um, and we, we, we appreciate you, Anna, taking some time to start this up again and yeah, no being here for us. Yeah, yeah. and again, yeah. like I'm, I'm it, even if you like, you can you can send me questions preemptively, and I can certainly do some digging and some research to see if I can I can find out any information. Okay. Okay, That'd be great. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Thank oh, you, Anna. Okay. This may be impolitic to ask you right now, but. How's your mom and dad doing? They're good. They're they're really good. Spirits okay. are good. They're healthy. They uh they love where they are. So yeah, that's to not in politics at all. <laughs> okay. Good. Okay. Bye. I'm thinking about them. Okay. Bye, Bye. guys. Thank you. Bye guys. Thank you.